ESU USA 100 years expanding minds, strengthening friendships, unlocking opportunities. English speaking union, Central Florida branch. afternoon. I'm Barbara Hughes, president of the Central Florida branch of the English Speaking Union. May I welcome you to the third Zoom program of our 2020-2021 ESU year. Thank you for joining us today, both members and guests. I feel very confident that Jan Clanton's program will bring a spark of sunshine into our somewhat dreary day due to Tropical Storm Edda. So now it is my pleasure to turn the meeting over to Ovid Vitas, who will introduce Jan Clanton. Jan Clanton received her Bachelor's of Arts in Art History from Rollins College. She's the former Adult Program Specialist, Special Project Coordinator, Assistant Curator of Education and Coordinator of Educational Programs during her 29-year career at the Orlando Museum of Art. Jan received the 2014 Outstanding Achievement Award for Arts and Culture from the Women's Executive Council. She has offered many art appreciation classes, including Rollins College and Life at UCF. Jan's presentation today is titled, John Singer Sargent, The Move to London. So on behalf of the English Speaking Union, Central Florida Branch, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Jan Clanton. I am so happy to be with you all today. I even think the weather's cooperating. There's nothing better than being inside on sort of a quasi rainy day and finding out about John Singer Sargent, who was uh, described as being uh, civilized to, uh, um, to his fingertips. He was a American expatriate who was born in 1856. And it was a life uh, that he spent in Europe with his peripatetic parents who thought they would just see everything that Europe had to offer. Little did they know that their son would literally absorb all of this cosmopolitanism. He uh, was born in Florence, and can there be any more perfect place for John Singer Sargent to start? Now, he, this is a uh, painting he did in Venice 
but clearly there is so much to absorb there of art and history. As a young man, he came to Paris and he was curious to find out about these avant-gardists. What were these impressionists up to? And he was able to cross the Pyrenees and find the treasures that were awaiting him in Spain. This is a painting by the great Spanish master Velazquez of the 17th century. And I love to use this particular piece to introduce you to some of the textural richness that Sargent would have picked up from this particular artist. Look at the drips of water on the water seller's jug. Look at the glaze on the jug that rests on the table. And then the pristine crystalline surface of the glass. This is just a tour de force of something that is such a banal everyday subject. Its richness, I'm sure, touched John Singer Sargent too. I think it is interesting to note that even though he saw all these riches, it was to London that he found his greatest success. And here in his portrait of the Wyndham sisters, you can see how he was able not only to capture a sense of the sitter, the ladies there sitting and lounging on their couch, but also to suggest the richness and the, well, the extravagance of life that was lived by the upper class. He took all these influences in and it is shocking to me that throughout his lifetime, he was criticized for not being avant-garde to some and to others, he was too traditional. So uh, here he is and he was seen as a mere compromise to many of his contemporaries. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is the most fabulous compromise I can imagine. I think we are going to be able to sit back and just enjoy watching his progress from his first real uh, instructor right up until his retirement age. So make yourself comfortable, get something to drink, forget about the weather and sit back. He of course was known his entire life as a portraitist. And it, he was criticized particularly because they said he only painted the imperial elite of the continent and eventually of America. But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look beyond the taffeta and the crinolines and the chiffon. I want you to notice how he is depicting a class right at the turn of the century, a very aristocratic class that was in transition. And we will see that by making some comparisons between the uh, portraits that he did in London and those in America. So with that said, I think we need to start with his first teacher. I think you need to get some background on what that tells us about his personality and really get to know this gentleman. He went to Paris in 1876, excuse me, 74, to learn the trade that would make him a successful artist the rest of his life. And one of the first paintings that he would have seen at the Paris Salon that year was this painting by Claude Monet entitled Impression Sunrise. It had been painted in 1872. And when it went on display, everybody who looked at it said, what in the world is this? What is that orange dot? What is that black scribble in the center? Is this painting finished? This was the painting that 
a critic said Monet was giving us an, an impression of what he saw. And from then on, that group was termed the Impressionists. But at the same salon, here, this was an example of the avant-gardist. But also on display was this painting by Cabanal. And it was entitled The Birth of Venus. Here she is floating up on a, I guess a shell on the shoreline. And it was so popular and so traditional and people thought so beautiful that the artist was asked to paint two more copies of it because there was such a demand. So this is what Sargent was faced with in Paris. On one side, the Impressionists that were so far out of uh, the academy and this by Cabanal. Now, I want to make a point here. You might think that everybody in Paris during the Belle Epoque was just thrilled to have nudes on their wall. Well, that wasn't necessarily the case. The only reason this was uh, acceptable in polite company was because it was the birth of Venus, a mythological creature. It had nothing, of course, to do with real life. Well, of course, that's what they told themselves. They might have been a little hypocritical, but nevertheless, I wanted you to see that he had such extremes to consider for how he would develop his career. And so for his first compromise, he chooses this gentleman as his master. This is Carolus Duran, and Carolus Duran would be the perfect midpoint between the Impressionists and the Academicians. Carolus Duran is shown in a portrait by John Singer Sargent, painted when Sargent was 23. Now, look at this. This is one of my favorite paintings. It reminds me of another portrait painted by um, Velasquez. Look at the warm skin tones and the taupey green of the jacket, the rich brown of the background, and then these stark jots of white that take your eye to all the important aspects of this painting. We look at the forehead of Carolus Duran where light is showing on his forehead, almost implying that that's where inspiration, where genius arises. We follow the white uh, collar down, but it definitely is like a focal point on the face. And we end up with his ruffles coming out of his sleeves, but they lead us to his magnificent fingers. I mean, it's great to have the idea in your brain, but you need the expertise of physical manipulation of paint and brush to come up with success. I think this is a portrait that tells us exactly how Sargent felt about his mentor. And the first thing that Carolus Duran pointed out to Sargent was to embrace the a la prima method of painting, which is painting directly on the canvas with no preliminary studies or uh, outlines to get the essence of the image right from the get-go. And he used Velasquez as an example of how to do, how the master did this. Velasquez's most famous painting is probably this, Las Meninas. It is a painting of the royal princess who you see there in the center. Velasquez was feeling very powerful and probably pretty smug because he includes himself in this portrait. You see him there on the left side. But what Carolus Duran wanted Sargent to see clearly was how from a distance the young princess 
looks perfectly well painted, like every other person in this painting with detail, details of lace and satin and um, even the hair of the dog. But when you look closely, you find out that Velazquez created that Gothamer hair with almost a dry brush that gives you a sense that her hair is silken thin. And look at her sleeve. In the, from a distance, those sleeves look perfectly painted. But when you look at them closely, you see they are squiggles of lines, a suggestion. Now, of course, there's a fine line between this and what the Impressionists were going to do, but it is that manipulation of the paint and the brush to create the aspect of a, a fabric or a satin and a silk. This was extremely important for um, Sargent to learn and he was, had been able to see these paintings when he traveled to Spain and now could apply them when he wanted to do his mature work. And this was one of his first paintings under the tutelage of Carolus Duran. It's entitled Luxembourg Gardens. It was painted in 1879. So it's a few years after he arrived and I, can't, I think it's a gorgeous painting, but it looks very impressionistic to me. And so it makes me think, aha, here's our friend Sargent trying out an impressionist approach. Now, if you look at this carefully, you see that it is, it's, it's really a remarkable color because it is twilight and the light the natural light is changing. And so even the gravel almost takes on a mauveish cast to it. And in the background that everything softens and there are no hard edges. There are jots of red along the uh, wall there with the flowers that take your eye. Look at the pond that is in the background on the right side it looks like it is filled with liquid mercury. It is just shimmery and, um, well, actually breathtaking. And if you look at the lady's gown, she is walking, uh, strolling with her gentleman friend. It is really an idol in the park. Her gown looks very exquisite. And I was reminded of another expatriate that's right over there uh, James McNeil Whistler. Look at Lady Mew and look how her gown has that kind of squiggle of satin down the side and these limpet colors that are very hard to, to actually call their shade. They're very suggestive of, well, a ephemeral color that we each see it in our own way. So here you have his first presentation after coming to Paris. And we could say, gee, this could be a wonderful launching pad to an impressionist career. The only thing that's very, very strange, look at all the black that is included. An impressionist would never have had black even on his palette. So prepare yourself for what is to come next. Here is El Alio from 1882, a couple of years later. And ladies and gentlemen, it is the antithesis of what we just looked at. It's like he's gone from being an avant-gardist to painting something that has black that might have been used as Spanish scene in Velazquez's painting. This is a moment of transcendence transcendence as the flamenco dancer tosses her hand, gathers up her skirt into a whoosh and is ready to tap her feet in a staccato manner. 
you can see a lady in orange on the right side who is definitely right in the dance with her. I am also fascinated by the fact that the banjo, the guitar players in the background, their hats almost look as though they are dots on a line of music. And it comes together, I feel like I'm in a, um, a bodega or a taverna that might be underground, that the lighting is severe because there's only a little bit of it. You know, this was the same time, 1882, when Carmen was written by Bizet, which was also considered to be very, very risque. Now, of course, the lady who is dancing is probably of uh, a descendant or part of the gypsy class, which was lower than low class. They were the thieves. They were the people that snuck in in the night and stole food from your larder. They were not considered particularly good people, but they had a flash and a glamor, almost like a forbidden fruit. Edouard Manet was fascinated with them too, but his painting of uh, Spanish dancers or flamenco dancers is much more tame than the one we saw there from Sargent. It is a painting that has strong sexual overtones and it is very asymmetric. Um, it seems like Sargent has thrown away everything he might have learned from an academician and is doing things He's responding to a scene almost like he is there. I think it is absolutely breathtaking. But when the critics saw it in 1882, they did not call it breathtaking. They called it a conundrum. It was salon size, which was 12 feet by 8 feet. So this was almost live size. But they felt nobody in their right mind wanted a salon-sized painting of something that was such an underclass subject. Well, I think, once again, Sargent is a young man. He is still in his 20s. He's trying a number of things. It's very exciting to see this. And none other than Isabella Stewart Gardner bought this painting for her house in Boston. You can imagine what they must have thought of that in Boston, but it is still in her museum. And if you get up there, please go in and visit. It will take your breath away and you can almost hear the tambourines and the clickety clacks going. Well, because Sargent was an intelligent man, even at his young age, he decided that something a bit tamer might be in order. And he was asked to paint the portrait of his dear friend's daughters. And here is his first portrait to go on display at the Paris Salon. This is the daughters of Edwin Darley Watt. And I look at it and I think, well, First off, I notice, and you probably will too, that it is a perfectly square painting. Now, most portraits are long and linear, reflecting the stature of the person, but this is not a normal portrait. It is Sargent's way to show homage again to Velasquez. This, believe it or not, is a square portrait also. And with that said, I think he addresses something else that was au courant at the time. This is a portrait that was painted after the camera was invented. Before cameras were invented, the portraitist, Paul Raison d'Etre, 
was to record the reality, the likeness of the person. But after the camera was invented, the portraitist now was required to almost go beyond just reality and to paint the spirit, and I say that in quote, the spirit of the sitter. Well, you're looking at this, and I know we've seen portraits of multiple family members, but hardly ever in this arrangement. And I think it adds so much piquancy to this particular portrait because our eye looks at each and every girl. We notice their home. Look at those uh, wonderful Asian urns. They're right up there at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts where this painting is on display. So you can see their size and really get a clear understanding of how old the girls were. We see a Chinese or Japan Asian screen on the red screen on the right. And we can look into the apartment. It looks quite lovely, beautiful rugs. But we wonder about the spirit of these girls. Can you guess who is the princess of the family? Who is sitting there almost in the center of the portrait? Can you guess who is teacher's pet? Who keeps her hands behind her back so she's not knocking anything down? And can you see the girls that are edging right into adolescence and love to keep secrets? Sargent has worked this so that, ladies and gentlemen, even we, though we know these are the four daughters of William Darley Bois, we actually have a portrait of childhood, of a childhood world right in front of our eyes. I think it is uh, a fabulous way to introduce us to why Sargent decided to focus for his success on portraiture, because he certainly was making this a success. So you might think for the next couple of years at least, he would paint children and paint traditional portraits because it would be a safe way to learn a living. But oh heck, ladies and gentlemen, we saw what happened to Sargent a few years earlier. He went from idyllic walks in the park to sexual transcendence in El Alio. Hold on to your socks because here's when we get his most famous portrait of his lifetime. And of course, that is Madame X that was painted in 1883 to 1884, a non-commissioned portrait, I might add, because Madame Gautreau was looking for that she presented such a regal and outrageous presentation I think Sargent was beguiled by what he could do with a portrait of her. Now, of course, we've all heard the story about the strap of her gown that was originally dripping down her arm. It was quickly painted back up on her shoulder. But when the critics saw this painting, oh, they could hardly take a deep breath. First off, they, of course, noticed the deep sweetheart neckline on the bodice. But frankly, styles of fashion had always been rather extreme, particularly for the upper class. But they also commented on her heavy makeup or powder on her chest and on her arms, you know, that Virginie Gartreau had grown up in New Orleans and had married a um, older gentleman who was quite wealthy. And of course, 
she powdered her body to achieve that milk white skin, but it was very apparent that it was powdered, almost to the point of looking mauve or uh, a little purplish. They also commented on her rouged ear, her hennaed hair, and even how far she had turned her neck to give us this almost silhouette, but we see the distension of her tendon in her neck. This was a painting that absolutely was really outrageous to the class conscious Parisians. And it was because innately they saw Virginie Gautreaux as an interloper. She was an American expatriate who had married, as I mentioned, an older, wealthier gentleman. And for most of the upper crust, she was referred to, well, I should say the snobs referred to her in the 19th century as a professional beauty, implying that here was somebody who had used her physical charms to achieve a status in society that had traditionally been reserved to people by birth. It was a, what we might call in the 21st century, a social climber. And to paint a professional beauty as such revealed a little too much of the spirit of this particular sitter. I think it was revealing her soul, but the soul that she probably wanted to keep hidden. I can imagine that this was a painting that outraged her family when it was put on display at the Salon in 1885. But there is some new um, documentation that became available in 2015, just five years ago, that was a letter in which Madame Gautreaux writes, and I quote, Mr. Sargent has made a masterpiece of the portrait, end quote. And when it was disclosed, the, uh, the way the critic wrote it was that this letter will now become the smoking gun of all scholar, uh, Sargent scholarship because it makes it clear that both artists and the sitter, Madame Gautreaux, were aware that they wanted to have a portrait that would literally attract all attention. They just didn't consider it being a scandal. So it was uh, a reason for Sargent to think that he might need to find another location for his portraits, but I think there was intent on his part to attract a lot of attention. And you know, in London, portraiture was more in this vein, which was the pre-Raphael light style. This is a portrait by Daniel, excuse me, Dante da Gabriel Rossetti, Garolandata, that was painted in 1874. And you can see that uh, young women and their beauty seems to be a tad stylized. You can see three faces there. They have similar attributes, but they are tied directly to the enjoyment of music and poetry, uh, literature, mythology, there is a sense of yearning and innocence that is there, albeit sometimes with a darkness simmering underneath it. But certainly it was nothing in comparison to what 
we see in Madam Godfro, Madam X. Madam X was a full-blown woman with wiles of her own, and it was completely apparent to all who saw it. Well, as I mentioned, Sargent was thinking of going to London, and he decided to test the waters a bit. He had painted a portrait of uh, Dr. Posse, and it is a bravura portrait if there ever was one. And he sent this to London in 1884 to be shown at the Royal Academy. Now, I wanted to mention to you that there is a new book out entitled The Man in the Red Coat by Julian Barnes. And uh, I have a uh, copy of it right here. But it is a book that fills in the um, sort of ambiance between Paris and London at that time. Dr. Posse, of all things, was Madame X's gynecologist. He was a doctor and was a very well-respected doctor. He was very interested in treating women with the same professionalism that men receive. Um, he was a pioneer in all of this. Uh, you can I can't imagine what uh, doctors, how they treated women in the 19th century, but this was a man who was going to elevate that science. But once you find out that this is Madame X, gynecologist, look at those fingers. I mean, they are splayed across this fabulous red, uh, well, coat, I call it a dressing gown. And um, it just is almost titillating. I think what Sargent was actually trying to do was to use, again, another portrait by Velasquez as an example, this one being Innocent the Tenth, which even the Pope said, I think it is too real. Look at the scowl on his face. But I think for sure the red says everything about his clerical position, just as the red here denotes this gentleman as a person of uh, stature, but also flair. Well, when this painting went on display in London, I think there was a lot of titillating at the academy. And so to kind of make amends, Sargent painted Carnation Lily Little Lily Lily Rose in 1887. And it took him a couple of uh, summers to paint this, but the light in this particular painting, named for a popular song of the day, just shimmers in this painting. I read a review of it that said, if you see this in person at the Tate Museum, it glows on its own. Uh, Sargent had to have lots of candies for the girls. He could only paint for a couple of minutes each day because he was trying to capture that light at twilight. And so it took him a while. He eventually had to stick artificial flowers in the ground to make it all come together. But when the British nation saw this, they thought, well, this portraitist might be just the answer. And so as he was building his reputation in the 80s there in London, this was a picture that was shown often and well received. And it was during this time that Sargent made his transition to London. He had known that the English market for portraits was a bustling market. It was something that the British guarded with great reverence, and that was their legacy, their heritage, all of their generations 
And this painting by Gainsborough is one of my favorites, main, uh, Robert Andrews and his wife, mainly because Robert Andrews looks like a Bubba here, and uh, Mrs. Andrews looks like she has just sucked a lemon. But these are just great portraits because look how he's got his gun tucked in his arm, he's casual, and Mrs. Andrews clearly was not crazy in love with this gentleman, but possibly brought a lot of land with her betrothal. And it was portraiture that that uh, Sargent was not going to copy, but was going to pick up and turn into a turn of the century success. He not only became successful, ladies and gentlemen, he became a legend. And you can see here in his portrait of Grace, the Marchioness of Corazon, that he understood the English psyche better than anyone around. Distinctions of rank were the most jealously guarded. And look at Grace. She seems like she is floating there on her chair. She has uh, her gown that's made of gossamer. She is absolutely breathtaking with earrings that are popular today. Hers were probably dripping with diamonds, but it is that face, the eyebrows, the length of her nose that set us understanding that Sargent is painting her soul. I think in looking at the clothing, the backdrop, the richness of the colors, you have a sense of a flamboyant style. This, um, I think, is Lady Helen v Vincent, the Visconsul d'Avenant who was a member of the souls. Now, to be a member of the souls meant you were in the highest of the aristocratic group. You were cosmopolitan and on multiple homes. You traveled extensively. You probably had many uh, liaisons. You had a life that, oh, and this is a term I love, it was called conspicuous leisure. So here you start to see how Sargent is capturing more than just the trappings of status, but the whole attitude of status. Here are the Mrs. Vickers and Florence Mabel and uh, actually, I'm sorry, these are the Atchison sisters. And um, here they're participating in uh, picking oranges, not off of a tree, but off of an orange topiary that's there in a large jardinere. This is a group of ladies who spend most of their day changing their clothes. And there is a, a sense that this is something that is unique to them. And you will start to see this setup with three sisters will become extremely popular for Sargent and that he will use it in a number of different variations that seem to engage the family and make him extremely popular. Here are the Mrs. Vickers. Now, here's where we start to see the push-pull that we saw really in the early works of Sargent. Mr. Vickers was the Honorable um, Thomas, he was the Colonel Thomas Vickers. He was owned an engineering business and he was quite wealthy. But there's an entirely different tone here 
than what we saw in the Atchison sisters. These girls have a book. They are seated close to a table where there are implements for tea and they are in a home that does not look like a castle. This is a middle class that is starting to assimilate and to make an impact there in London. And even the clothing, we have one gown, that the white gown that seems to have lots of ribbons and maybe some uh, uh, chiffon or sheer silk there in the youngest sister. But the two older sisters, and you know the one here on the right who is Clara, pulls us into the room. It's almost as though she's engaging with us, the viewer. So here you have an entirely different soul of our sitters. They are interested in reading. They are engaging with other people. They are living in a house that comports to something closer to a normal standard of living. And this painting I included because notice how the dog has found its bed there because these gowns are so bouffant and whirled around that he couldn't pass up a warm bed. These are the Mrs. Hunters. And you see here three daughters again, uh, really arranged almost as the opposite shape of the fan in one of their hands. You see this almost perfect pyramid reflected there in their arrangement and the arrangement of the fan. I found it very interesting that the um, when this painting went on display, the person who thought it was the best work of Sargent was none other than Rodin. He was fascinated with it. He loved the composition. He loved the screens in the background and felt that this was the best. I mentioned the Wyndham sisters to you earlier, and now I thought we would uh, discuss all the details here. This to me is the uh, epitome of conspicuous leisure. They all have a sense of relaxation and as though they blow about. These three ladies, and they married quite well from left to right are Lady Echo, Mrs. Adine, and Mrs. Pennant. They were considered to be the debutantes of the year, so to speak. And behind them is a portrait of their mother. I don't know whether that uh, costs more to have not only the children, but also the recreation of the mother. But notice how the light glints off glances off the gilt frame. Just another suggestion of the richness of this particular room. And I love the addition of fresh flowers, uh, not only next to the girls, but also in the background. Additional painting, the brocade of the couch itself. But I think it is really the arms of uh, Mrs. Aideen there in the middle. She stretches those out in such a wonderfully relaxed and at peace with the world, like, of course, this is the way to live, that it seems to conjure up even more than some of the other paintings. I think uh, with all the white or champagne colored gowns, you have a sense that this is the, the finest materials purchasable at the time. It is absolutely breathtaking and something that conjures up an age that, as I mentioned, was starting to feel 
like it was in transition. The middle class, other countries taking over, losses in war for Britain, things like this that would shake some of that conspicuous leisure out of them. But one of my favorite portraits is this one. It is a portrait of Lord Ribblesdale. It was painted in 1902. And I just think it is, well, it's the quintessential British aristocrat. And this too was not commissioned. He was such an icon of the British uh, nobleman that Sargent decided to paint him without charging him what he normally did, which was about $100,000 in today's money. Lord Ribblesdale is supremely grave. He's tall as a tree. He's identified with that palladium detail behind looking like a column there, that he is the column. He is what holds up the British empire himself. He has a wonderful dishabille uh, slouch about him. He has on his top hat, of course, he's going out to ride. But there is a sense that there's a looseness to his cravat. And look at those pants, ladies and gentlemen, his jodhpurs. Now, they are a heavily draped material. I even wonder if they could be uh, a fine leather. They are so heavy in their uh, quality. And you can see the lightest touch of buckles on the highly polished boots. Everything here gives the impression, you know, a couple of buttons aren't done on his west, west coat. He just has this air about him that is almost palpable. And if you think of those pants, and notice that it is a squiggle of white that makes their heavy draping work. It is like he has perfected by 1902 when this was painted, exactly that a la prima method that his mentor, Carolus Duran, told him to look at when he looked at Velasquez's paintings. I've heard it described as the genius of the wrist, but he has those jodhpurs just as perfect as they can be. This is a man fully in control. He, uh, the light comes and rakes across his face from the right side of the canvas so that his nose, his eyebrow, give us a sense of his character. And I think without a doubt, Sargent has reached the effigy of portraiture here with Lord Rib Ribblesdale. Now, I um, think that it is important also to look at some of the painting that he was doing. Well, we want to see this one. This is Lady Agnew of Lochnaw. And Lady Agnew of Lochnaw was very interested in getting her portrait painted by Sargent because only the creme de la creme were having them painted. And um, it was quoted that a three-quartered painting like this could run close to, well, they, it, it was uh, 500 guineas. It might have, that might have been for a full length portrait, but really close to $100,000 in today's money. He painted over 800 portraits during his career. Not all of them costing quite that uh, price, but it gives you an understanding that it was through portraits like this that Sargent was able to save money and become financially independent. 
I think it's very interesting to look at the um, chair in which she is seated, uh, upholstered in fine silk. The walls are covered in silk. And if you look at her face closely, I always think it is uh, kind of fun to cover one side of her face and look at the one that's exposed and then cover the other one. She has one side of her face that is almost breaking into a smile. And she has the other side of her face that looks like it is ready to give you a smirk. And I think there is no one better than Sargent who has captured this ability of a face to have contrasting emotions at the same time. She was hoping Sargent could paint this in 55 minutes. That may have been the cause for her losing a little bit of patience. But um, here is Mrs. Carol Meyer and her children. And you saw this in the beginning. I think it is a stunning portrait. But it is not until you read the history of it that you find out that Mrs. Carol Mayer, Meyer, excuse me, and her husband had recently bought a grand estate outside of London and they were joining the social world. Mrs. Meyer and her husband were Jewish and there was extreme anti-Semitism in London at the time. And so this painting was not well received even though you and I know it is a magnificent portrait. It is an unusual uh, point of view. I feel like I'm standing on a ladder looking down at Mrs. Meyer, but you can't deny that the satin skirt and the underskirt, the wonderful Bertha collar with all the satin and, uh, well, look at that fan in her hand. It's gossamer and her children too, who are peeking from behind the uh, settee or love seat. Look at the detail in the house. This was a little distasteful for some of the people reviewing her painting in London. Now, just as I did with some of Sargent's early works, I want you to see how he was painting Americans at this time. And the first one is a portrait of Mrs. Adrian Islin. Mrs. Islin and her husband were quite uh, wealthy. She wanted to have her portrait painted. And she had her maid bring all of her gowns from Worth and all of the great couturier houses for Sargent to pick out what she should be painted in. He said he wanted none of those. He would paint her in the dress that she was meeting him in. And it gives you a stark and clear psychological profile and look into this woman's spirit. She seems to be a very much of a taskmaster. And if there was any doubt of that, look at the little finger on her right hand. That one detail seems to tell me as much about this woman as her very strong countenance this is not a woman you want to cross any way, shape, or form. He also painted a portrait of his great benefactor here in the United States. This is Isabella Stewart Gardner. He placed her in front of a Persian weaving, and it almost looks like she is the sun radiating warmth and light uh, herself. But her husband, Mr. Gardner, thought this portrait was indecent. And of course I thought, oh, maybe he never saw Madame X. But he felt the pearls around her waist was the too suggestive. And the portrait was not allowed in his house until after his death. So again, you see a much more puritanical approach to portraiture here in the States. But another favorite is this one of Mr. and Mrs. 
Isaac Phelps Stokes. And it has an entirely different feel than the conspicuous leisure of the European portrait. Mrs. Stokes has just come in from playing tennis and the original intent was her to hold the leash of her Great Dane in her right hand. Well, the dog was not agreeable. And so Mr. Stokes said he would fill in for the dog. Well, I think it says a lot about um, the American portrait that he painted. As we got to the turn of the century, Sargent was becoming extremely tired of painting portraits. As I mentioned, he had painted approximately 800. He had painted 2,500 other works too. So this, this man was voracious and painting all the time, but he had received a commission from the Boston Public Library. It was building a new building and they wanted him to do some artwork in that building. At the same time, the Widener Museum on the um, Harvard campus was being completed and he was requested to do work there. And at the same time, he was doing a number of uh, travel studies and using, oh, before that, he was hired by the British government to be the official artist of World War I. And this is his painting gas, which he did for the uh, government of Great Britain to make sure that all people living there knew the cost of the world war and how many young men were damaged from that. He also was lucky enough, as I mentioned, he had painted all these portraits at princely sums to travel and he could relax and paint white sunlight reflected off of sheep in a friend's bedroom. He could use watercolors to capture the nuances of the water in the Venice Canal. He could examine how watercolors could help him examine modernism that had been initiated at, you know, by the post-impressionist and some of the other artists that were using form and color and shape without any story to tell. This is a watercolor that you almost miss the person who is leaning in to take a sip out of the pond there. These pictures were acclaimed in London and Paris and in New York, and there was a great demand for them. They were absolutely beautiful. And for people who were now both aristocrats and middle class traveling around the world, they were fascinating for them. But keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, his solid success in England allowed him to reimagine, reinvent himself at a time when most other people were retiring. You have to say, lucky sergeant. He figured out at an early age that a move to London could make all the difference in the world. Well, I think it is interesting to look back on some of his portraits. He was criticized throughout his career because everybody thought his subject matter was not avant-garde enough. Well, I'll tell you, I think with this portrait, he kind of exploded onto the scene just the way Monet had done also. He was criticized because 
his flourishes and his ruffles and his satins and silk were nothing more than dilettante haberdashery. They didn't see the lurking question in Lady Agnew's face that almost is a harbinger of where do we go from for here from here. I think in looking at Reposé, a painting of his niece, there is a sense of ennui that is almost palpable. Yes, it's conspicuous leisure at its finest, a fabulous gown of silk and satin. But there is also something about this and all of the tonalities of that same fabulous topish green that we saw in the first portrait of Carolus Duran that implies this is transitional. It's not one extreme or another. I think in looking at this, it there is a lingering aura of the fin de siècle, cycle, the end of an era. John Singer Sargent, born in 1856, died in 1925, was accused of superficiality of characterization. But with his bravura handling of paint, his suggestion of luxurious details, and his opalescence of materials, Sargent imbued his paintings with a powerful presence of the sitter and the projection of social life and the crystallization of the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, no one looks at these paintings today that doesn't feel like they have been given a snippet of their life and are thrilled, even for a moment, to go back over a hundred years and to feel the impact of the Belle Epoque in Paris and wish we too could have experienced it. We can through the paintings of John Singer Sargent, an American expatriate who never gave up his American citizenship, but could make a record for us in later generations of exactly what he saw there. It has been a treat for me to be able to bring this um, lecture on John Singer Sargent for you to enjoy on this rainy afternoon and um, to hope that you can either read books about him to get to know more or travel to museums one day in the future and enjoy his works again. I don't know whether there are any questions and I will yep. just turn that back over to Oak. Well, good afternoon, everyone, again. Uh, it'll be Richard um, here. And thank you, Ms. Clanton, for your time um, and, and the very informative uh, lecture that you gave us here today about John Singer Sargent, the move to London. Um, I would like to remind now all our participants any questions that you might have, please feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. When you move your mouse over the Zoom, you should be able to see it there. Type in your questions. And as soon as they come up, I'll go ahead and start reading them over to Miss Jan Clanton. If it's okay with everybody, I would like to get started with one of the first questions, if you may, uh, Miss Clanton. Mm -hmm. I noticed that many of Sargent's paintings, um, there's not that many people smiling. Um, can you say why that is? I think I have a clue, but it's very interesting to see if um, my clues that. And my second question, what is it about, or what was it about John Sargent's um, life, his work that inspired you to speak about him today? Well, I can answer the first one. First of all, um, you know, I think it is an American trait to smile. And if you've ever traveled in Europe, you know that they think Americans smile at strangers, and that's very strange. But 
I do think that what Sargent was trying to record was not a winning personality, but the very um, structured, disdainful attitude that uh, the upper class sometimes had, and they wanted to be remembered as a serious person. So the smile would not have been appropriate in any way, shape, or form. Um, as far as why I am fond of Sargent, uh, I think that his work is ravishing. Uh, the draftsmanship is excellent. I love the details. If you've ever gone to a historic home, you know exactly what he is depicting. It's a snippet of life. But also, I have been very lucky to travel in my career uh, at the Orlando Museum of Art. And if there has ever been a Sargent exhibition, I tried to plan a trip there. So I have seen a large body of his work and um, find his work to be exquisite. Great, thank you for that, thank you. Um, I also like to remind everyone um, that this session, this meeting is being recorded. Um, we wanna make that sure that you are aware of that. If you don't know where the chat is, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question to Ms. Clanton. Uh, feel free, I'll give everyone a few minutes uh, to gather their thoughts um, and then we'll take it from there and see. Okay, so I'm seeing no questions coming up. Oh, well, here we go. I do have a question from Rosa. And the question, thank you, Rosa, for your question. What similarities or differences do you see between Whistler and Sargent? I hope I pronounced that right, Whistler. Well, that is a fabulous question. And um, I uh, will try to make it as distinct as I possibly can. Of course, they were both expatriates living in Europe, and uh, they were both in London at times. Um, Whistler was a firm devotee of art for art's sake, and he was very influenced by Asian work that was coming over and flooding the markets in Paris. A lot of the French Impressionists were uh, profoundly impacted by their aesthetic also. But Sargent never seemed to have the same interest in the um, in the Asian influence, a very asymmetric composition and flattened spaces. Rather, I think he became a fairly close friend of Claude Monet. And I think if he veered towards anything, it might have been more of the Impressionist touch. But they both were fascinated, uh, particularly Whistler, in some of his symphonies and nocturnes with the changing light. You notice that he even named some of his portraits symphonies and nocturnes. Uh, Sargent never uh, was as much of a, a, an aesthete as Sargent was. Whistler was much more interested in the, the cultural aspects and um, he also was very involved with decorative arts, particularly in the Peacock Room. Um, Sargent never went in that direction. He was much more interested in the movement of paint. Great, thank you. All right, we got a couple of more questions. Next question is from Laura. Did Sargent maintain his relationship with his mentor? Another question, what do the Impressionists think of Sargent's work? Well, the first thing I can say is I know that Sargent maintained a relationship with Carolus Duran for at least five or seven years. I don't know. I think he really, once he left France, once he left Paris, in 1885 or 1886, I think he was on his own in London. 
Then he uh, spent time traveling to America in the 1880s. So he was pretty much, uh, but you know, he learned a great deal from Carolus Duran and that was important. Uh, as far as um, how he, was the question why, uh, how he differed or what the impression- What the impressionists think of his work? Well, um, as I mentioned, he was an, an American, an expatriate. He never could get black out of his palette. He used black very effectively and no impressionist worth his salt had black on their palette. So that was one thing. The other thing, um, I think because the impressionist, of course, did portraits, but their focus was on the movement of light. They were much more landscapist. And um, it was not until Sargent was financially successful and more or less had quit painting portraits in 1907 that he did landscape. So they, they had, they respected each other. They just moved in different directions. And um, the Impressionists, I think would have, they painted together. I know that Sargent painted with Monet because there's a famous quote that Sargent asked Monet for a dab of black and Monet looks at him and says, oh, black, don't have any. So anyway, I think um, they were they were friendly, but they had a different agenda, so to speak. Great. All right, we got a couple of more questions. Next question is from Donna. Do any of Sargent's paintings go on sale today? If so, do they draw a high price? Well, I think a lot. Um, you know, I mentioned that he had. Uh, 800 portraits and 2,500 other paintings. So he had a lot of drawings and he had a lot of watercolors. Those are very vulnerable works. And I would imagine that there are still some of those out there around. His portraits in many cases were kept by the families for which they were painted. Um, if, when they left the family, they were usually given to a museum. I do know that um, I had a group from the Orlando Museum of Art up in New York one uh, November for the auctions and we went to a dealer's uh, gallery and he had a painting by Sargent that was for sale. And it was during, I mentioned that he did some travel painting. This was from his travel in the Alps when he was uh, hiking there during the summer months. And uh, we had it brought down to the museum. Um, it was uh, a price that I don't think, well, I know I wouldn't have spent, but maybe you would have. The museum um, went back and forth about it and there was discussion about it. And the museum eventually passed on it because they felt that they wanted a piece of work that was more representative of his style. And the museum bought a watercolor that shows a sergeant down in Miami at the Villa Vizcaya, which was, uh, he was there to paint the portrait of, trying to think of the gentleman who was down there. He was painting a portrait, and this was a watercolor that he did of a sailor sitting on a boat and the water and the masts of the ship. And uh, the museum felt that was a better example for them. So they do come on the market. They are not inexpensive. Thank you for that. Uh, here's one more question and then a comment. And I think I'll end it on that and move over to our president. This is from Ovid, Ovidas, and the famous picture of Madame X at the Paris Salon was without the right strap. It was modified later on when he added the missing strap. Why? Pressure from society and her husband? 
I think that is a very definite answer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think all I, I, I have not read the book that Ovid, uh, I think, has, but I do think that um, that was just going too far. And between everything else, you know, I mentioned the white skin, the implication being that she might not have had the white skin. It was just, there were so many things about this portrait that people looked at and were critical of. I think having to strap down her sleeve was um, pushing decorum too far. So I agree. It was something that would have been requested. I think maybe mother, uh, <laughs> Madame Gautreaux's mother asked for that strap to be put up. All right, and here we, and we'll end with this one from Steve Bertha. Um, I guess it's more of a comment or statement. Some of the paintings were of elongated figures like El Greco's, almost deformed. Well, it could have been, uh, that could have been traced to um, images that we, that I got for this PowerPoint. Sometimes uh, to get more detail, you can crop them. The only one that I know that was really uh, elongated was Lord Ribblesdale. He was larger than life size. Um, but the rest of them were either life size or smaller. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for your questions. At this time, I would like to welcome back ESU's Central Florida Branch President, Ms. Barbara Hughes, for some updates and final words. Barbara? Dan, I want to thank you for the exquisite, in depth look at each one of those pieces of art that you shared with us as John Singer Sargent was developing his technique and styles. That really um, was exquisite. Uh, thank, thank you for doing that. I, I really appreciated that. And I would like to say thank you for everybody to jo for joining us this afternoon. And we have an upcoming program in December. Our guest speaker is going to be Ian Stavins and his topic will be who owns the English language, <laughs> <laughs> which would be interesting. Unlike other languages such as French and Spanish and Italian, English does not have a federally funded academy to <laughs> safeguard and legislate, legislate on the health of the language, which I thought was very interesting. Dr. Stavins is the Lewis Sebring Professor of Humanities, Latin American and Latino Culture at Amherst College. So please join us on December 7th, which is a Monday, for our Zoom meeting at 3.30. And we will keep you updated as we get closer to it. And again, Jan, thank you so much. That was such an excellent uh, program this afternoon. And thank you so much to everybody who joined us. May I wish everybody a happy and a safe Thanksgiving filled with gratitude. We have much happy to be thankful for. To you too. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.